talk about hernia examination. So the only way to make hernia examination sound, oh, that's not so bad, is to do rectal examination first. <laughs> Right, because hernia examination too is sensitive, right? You're dealing with sensitive areas of the body. We're dealing with the groin area. We're dealing with exposing, you know, private areas. Um, so the same principles apply in terms of uh, guarding the privacy and confidentiality of the patient, making them as comfortable as possible while you do a pretty sensitive examination. So of course, you want to have an idea of what you're doing. So. What is a hernia? That's an important question to ask, right? You guys haven't seen a whole lot of patients with hernias. You know, anytime tissue squeezes out from an area where it should be into an area where it should not be. It doesn't have to be. I mean, today we're talking about external abdominal hernias primarily, specifically groin hernias, okay? But a lot of these principles apply to different types of hernia. But they can be internal or external. You can have a hiatal hernia. So you can have part of your stomach herniate into the chest cavity, into the thoracic area, right? Through a large abdominal um, diaphragmatic hiatus, okay? So the esophagus goes through a hiatus in the muscle. Sometimes that's too big. And somebody has um, some stomach and their esophagus uh, ride higher than it should into the thoracic cavity. Um, what do those people get? Lots and lots of heartburn. They've come to you saying, Doctor, I have really terrible heartburn all the time on their history. They may have a hiatal hernia. Um, you can have umbilical hernias that are external. That's an internal one. You can herniate internally through um, the mesentery or through a scar. Like these adhesions may create a space where you can herniate through one space into another in the abdomen. Okay? All these things we've talked about in history. Uh, children may have an umbilical hernia. So where your umbilicus or belly button is, you could actually have a herniation of abdominal contents. And most of the time, those close on their own if they're small, and most of the time we can leave those alone and they go away on their own, which is nice. Rarely they have to have surgery, but you know, the examination uh, principles will apply uh, to that as well. You want to assess both the hernia itself, is it reducible, all these things we're going to talk about in a minute. Okay, so as I said, today we're going to focus on external abdominal hernias, specifically in the groin area. So any questions about what a hernia is? You guys have a good handle on that? Probably. And this is the anatomy of the groin area. This is where we're headed. Again, I know sensitive area of the body, but you know, we have to talk about these things as doctors have to be prepared um, to do what has to be done for the patient. So again, what is a hernia? Well, one form of hernia is the indirect inguinal hernia. So you have inguinal hernias. So you see this arrow here. You have the arrow going from the internal inguinal ring which is at the midpoint of the line between the pubis symphysis and the anterior superior iliac spine, okay? And um, which is a little bit different than the midpoint from the pubic tubercle to the anterior superior iliac spine. So it's not dead in the middle of the groin area. It's a little bit medial to that. Um, and that is a space where uh, embryologically, that's where the testicles in men descend through into the scrotum right? Uh, and the spermatic cord along with it. And so there can be an opening there. And sometimes the abdominal contents will squeeze out into that area and they will follow the course of that canal that goes from the internal ring into this potential space in most people, but an actual space in someone with a hernia. And it can't even travel all the way down following the spermatic cord into the scrotal area. Okay? Um, so exits the abdomen through the internal inguinal ring, goes through the course of the inguinal canal, maybe all the way to the scrotum. These hernias will be above and medial to the pubic tubercle, so that's a clue as to what type of hernia you're dealing with, where you're seeing the swelling or the bulging, okay? 85% uh, of all hernias in the groin area are gonna be these. So if you're just guessing what kind of hernia do they have, this is a good guess, especially if they are young men, okay? And again, why is that? Well, again, because the testicle descended through that area, there could be a, a residual space there that the abdominal contents can enter. And uh, so that's why it's more common in them. Uh, it's why we check, uh, well, I'll leave that alone for now. Okay, so another type of hernia, the direct inguinal hernia. I hope these pictures are somewhat helpful as far as determining. Um, what type of hernias we're dealing with, what it means when we say these things. So, in this case, it's not going through the internal inguinal ring. It's not entering a natural opening 
and then going down the canal into the scrotum. Now it's entering through a muscular defect behind the inguinal canal. So it's finding another entry into the inguinal canal. All right, so it's directly into the, it doesn't kind of go around the long way, it goes directly, direct into the inguinal canal through a defect in the musculature, but behind the inguinal canal. And uh, these don't often go to the scrotum, but they theoretically could, but they don't often. It's still gonna be located above and medial to the pubic tubercle, okay? So inguinal hernia could be direct or indirect if you see it up in this area above and medial. Um, uh, is that above and lateral, I should say, I believe, now that I'm thinking about it. Anyway, we'll figure that out later. Um, it's going to be more common in the elderly, so especially if you have older men, um, but also older women, this is uh, going to be the type of hernia they'll most often have, okay? Yeah, yeah so, medial. yes, go ahead. What do you say? Medial. Above and medial, yeah. okay. I don't want to demonstrate on my own anatomy here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Above and medial, so I wrote it right. Uh, just when you get in front of people, it's hard to think straight sometimes, sorry. Um, yeah, so more common in the elderly, and that, that arrow is designed to show you the pathway. It's not coming through that internal inguinal ring like the indirect hernia. It's coming directly into the canal through a different defect in the musculature and then proceeding somewhat down the canal, usually not to the stroke. Okay. And then lastly, we want to consider femoral hernias. Well, what is that? Well, from anatomy, you guys know that as you go lateral to medial, you have what? We said navel always, N-A-V-E-L. So you have nerve, right? Uh, you have femoral artery, A. You have femoral vein, V. And then you have an empty space, the femoral canal, okay? And after that, lymphatics. But uh, that empty space is the area of concern for femoral hernias, okay? So this is gonna be below and lateral, this one's lateral, uh, to the pubic tubercle. And you know, the upper leg is more what we're talking about here, right? Um, more common in females because they don't have the uh, potential space as clearly demarcated as it is in males because they haven't had that dissension of the, the testicle and the um, spermatic cord into the scrotum. So uh, they do get more commonly these femoral hernias, okay? And it's the same thing. It's, you have peritoneum and some fluid and possibly abdominal organs, you know, abdominal contents going out of the abdomen into a space that is not in the abdomen, upper leg or groin through the inguinal canal, right? So if you have a female, again, playing the odds, you're gonna think it's more likely femoral, location will tell you if it's femoral or not, and then, um, you can proceed with the examination to confirm those suspicions, right? So why do we care about hernias? Why am I spending all this time talking about it? You should always ask that question, right? Presumably, if we're presenting a topic to you, it's important. That may or may not be the case. In this case, it is the case. Uh, there was a time when I walked into the emergency room to start a shift, and all I heard was screaming in agony from the corner of the emergency room. And you're thinking, whoa, what's going on in there? And so I asked the nurses, well, what's up with that guy? Like, we don't know. We haven't seen him yet. Okay, word to the wise, if somebody is screaming in agony in the corner room, go figure out what's going on in there. Okay, don't leave somebody like that sitting for a while. That's not good for you, your mental health, the other patient's mental health. Um, and probably they have something bad going on. Not always, but probably. So we worry about um, whether or not stuff is going to get stuck in these pockets of tissue, right? So what could get stuck? Well, this is one example. You might have somebody who has a tense swelling in the groin, and what that might be is a loop of bowel or some such thing that is squeezed out into that pouch created by the hernia. But the neck, you know, the, the entry point to the hernia is too narrow to accommodate free moving back and forth into the abdominal cavity. And over time, that can cause compression and swelling that swelling may actually cut off all the blood supply to that tissue, right? So incarceration, we use that word in normal English for someone who's in jail, they're incarcerated. So it's trapped. It can become trapped, bowel can, in this sac. After a while, if it's trapped, it may become strangulated, like we say strangled, you know, cut off 
oxygen and blood flow to it, um, it can become strangulated. These are surgical emergencies and they are excruciatingly painful for the patient, okay? Ischemic pain is excruciatingly painful. If you don't have enough blood flow through a tissue, you will hurt, you will hurt bad, you will hurt worse than almost anything, okay? So we worry about this because of incarceration and potential strangulation. Here you see the proximal bowels dilated because nothing can move through and then the distal bowels collapse because nothing's moving through. And in that neck is where the swelling and constriction is happening and where the blood flow is being restricted. Okay, so how do we examine these things? So the process begins with the patient standing. So unlike the rectal examination, we have the patient lay on their side on the table. In this case, you have the patient stand up. Why? Because you're looking for this bulging. And one of the things that can make it come out is gravity, okay? Gravity generates pressure. You know, if there's, if there's a space that may flow, things may flow downhill into that space, okay? So you start with them standing. And they may tell you, Doc, I just have this pulling or nagging sensation in that area. They may complain of swelling in that area. And you may get a history like, yeah, it's worse when I stand up and better when I lay down, okay? You may get a history like it's worse when I cough and uh, better when I don't. You may get a history like it's worse when I pick things up and increase abdominal pressure, okay? So you're looking for ways to uh, bring out the hernia. So gravity will do that for you. Start with them standing up and then by inspection, that first step, we're gonna look for bulging. If we don't see it, or if we do see it, you may have a patient cough. <coughs> Again, to apply some pressure to make it more obvious, more evident, this swelling, okay? Um, so if you do see that, you wanna note the position. Where is it? Um, where is it relative to the pubic tubercle? Is it more like ephemeral? Is it more likely inguinal? Okay, is it above and medial or below and lateral? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, below the inguinal ligament, it's going to be ephemeral, right? More so, that kind of thing. So note the position, and then we're going to proceed to palpation. So we're going to feel the external inguinal ring against that mid-inguinal point. So you go from the pubic symphysis to the anterior superior iliac spine and find the midpoint. That's about where um, it's going to be, okay? And you're going to feel for a defect there. And you're going to feel for any other muscle defects along the canal as you go down. And you're going to feel for an impulse there too. You might have the patient cough as you feel. <coughs> okay? Um, you may actually make this part of a scrotal examination as well. If the swelling extends all the way down into the scrotum, you're going to want to examine the external inguinal ring. So in that case, what you do is you actually, with the patient standing, uh, put your finger up against the scrotum, follow the spermatic cord up to where it enters the inguinal canal, and then push your finger on the opening, the external inguinal ring, and see if you're feeling swelling or bulging when they cough. See if you're feeling any kind of mass that shouldn't be there uh, on that examination. I will often couple this with cancer for testicular screening since the indirect inguinal hernia occurs mostly in young men, and that's the age group we're worried about testicular cancer screening, I may go ahead and get their consent and just do the whole thing in one examination because it's a good opportunity to do it. Combine multiple uncomfortable procedures into one but get them over with quickly. Uh, that kind of thing. So you're feeling for defects in the wall, you're feeling for the swelling, you're feeling for uh, the impulse of the patient coughs. If it's there and obviously bulging out, you may be worrying, okay, maybe we're dealing with incarceration, maybe we're dealing with potential strangulation. Okay, so then we lay the patient down. We take gravity away and we use it to our advantage. Does the swelling go away by itself? In other words, does it reduce spontaneously? In other words, without our help. Um, if it does, great. We put two fingers over the internal inguinal ring to get that mid-inguinal line. And we're gonna assess for is this indirect or direct. If it does not go back in, we have to try to put it back in. We're gonna manipulate it. We're gonna kind of use two hands most often and apply gentle pressure to try to reduce it, we call it, reduce the hernia. Um, in other words, to push the contents back into the abdomen. If it reduces easily, that makes us feel better that we're not dealing with incarceration and strangulation and or and strangulation, okay? Um, but yes, and sometimes it does require a little bit of work to get it to go back in. That's why we worry more about small hernia defects. If you find a small hernia defect, 
those actually can be more of a problem than large hernia defects. Why? Because there's very little chance of things becoming incarcerated or eventually strangulated if it's a large defect. They will flow easily in and out. It's these smaller defects that are more worrisome and more problematic and where we might have to intervene surgically. Okay? Well, let's say it reduces spontaneously. We put two fingers over the internal inguinal ring and then we're going to apply pressure, either having the patient cough or stand back up because we're closing the entry point for the indirect hernia that way, right? So if a hernia recurs, we know this is not indirect, it's direct, okay? If it does not recur, we think we're dealing with an indirect hernia because it, we're closing the entrance, it can't get in, there's no swelling. Um, that makes sense, right? So we start standing up, we lay them down to look for reduction. If it won't reduce, we reduce it. And then we're going to try to assess, okay, if it is an inguinal bulge, is it direct or indirect? We close the opening for the indirect and see if it recurs. That's direct if it recurs. If it does not recur, we assume we're dealing with an indirect hernia and we've just blocked its entry point into the inguinal canal. I'm sure we have plenty of time for you guys. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's very simple. So it's a series of positions, right? You start standing up, you examine things uh, by inspection first, and then you follow up the inspection of what did my eyes see. You follow a palpation to further define what I've seen and manipulate it some, or to, if you didn't see anything, do further investigation. Well, they're complaining of this bulging. I'm not seeing it. Let me see if I can find a defect in the muscle. Let me see if I can find a place where this might be occurring. It may not be immediately visible in all patients. You may have to actually do the palpation to, to bring it um, to your attention. Uh, I put this note at the end. You always want to examine the opposite side because they may have an asymptomatic hernia on the other side. If you have a huge swelling on the right side and a very small one on the left side, you might not notice it, right? You might not. You might not as the doctor examining it just by looking and the patient might not have noticed it. Um, I will say it's just bad form to send a patient for a hernia repair and then find out later they have another hernia. Okay, if you're going to do a surgery, you only want one anesthesia if you can get away with it, right? So anesthesia has its own risk. Having a procedure has its own risk. And so you want as few procedures as possible. So if there's a weakness on the other side, go ahead and fix both while you're at it, right? So the surgeon, again, if you're a primary care doctor sending someone for a referral or a consultation, hopefully the surgeon would do this, okay? And it wouldn't matter. But let's just be honest. We never want to leave things to chance. We always want, if there's a failure in the system, we want to make it so that it has to be a multi-level failure for something bad to happen to the patient. So in this case, please examine both sides every single time so that you don't miss the smaller hernia on the second side. And when you send them for the procedure, they get both repairs done at the same time, rather than breaking this thing into two procedures. I don't ever trust anybody to do the right thing. I don't really even trust myself to do the right thing. That's why I always follow systems of care. I always examine the other side because I wanna make sure the surgeon knows about it if there's one there. I wanna be sure for my own self, is there something there or not? So when I write the referral letter, I can say bilateral hernia and not just left hernia or right hernia. Okay? Plus, it just makes you look bad to your colleague who's a doctor. Oh, they didn't know enough to examine the other side. Nobody wants to look bad. Just do it. Do it the right way. When you're finished with the obvious problem, go make sure there's not another problem. Okay? Wrap it up that way for the hernia. Now, let's see if my summary slide made it. Ah, it did. Excellent. It wasn't on my phone when I checked it earlier. So, let's just sum things up, right? I'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions uh, if you would like as well. In sum, these examinations are sensitive. You guys know that intuitively. I don't have to really explain that to you, but that's why I say that you know there are, there are a few things in medicine that will test you. When you've made an error and you have to go to the patient and deal with that error, that will test you, it will test your character, your motivation, right? You could conceal the area, the, sorry, the error, the error, the mistake. You could conceal it. Is that good for the patient? Probably not. Probably not. It could be very, very bad for the patient, in fact. So we don't want to cover these issues. We want to, again, our motivation should be taking care of the human being who's come into our office and trusted us to take care of them. Okay? We want to build that trust, and we want to deal with things openly, 
honestly and seriously. We're professionals. We do these things because they need to be done, not because we like doing them or want to do them necessarily. Okay? They are sensitive. It can test your character. What kind of doctor are you going to be when you're not a trainee anymore, you're not a student anymore, and no one's looking over your shoulder to make sure you do the right thing? What will you do then? Okay? So it's important right now to be developing um, the right heart, the right attitudes, the right motivations. Because there's not a lot about medical education, unfortunately, that encourages you to have the right motivations, right? We're pretty rough on you guys, and you can start to feel a little bit selfish after a while. Like, oh, I need to take care of me. Nobody else is. Um, but in the end, that's, it's not about you. It's about the patient, okay? Someday you may be a patient, and you want, for the doctor who's seeing you, for it to be about you in that circumstance and not about the doctor, right? So, uh, do pay attention to your motivations, your heart, your character, um, and do what it takes to develop that. You know, that's not an educational thing for the most part. It's not a medicine thing for the most part. It's a, it's a spiritual slash human thing that you have to work on. Okay, they are crucially important. So yes, they're sensitive, but please do not neglect to do them. The most dangerous thing in medicine is the thing you don't know about or don't know to look for, right? You can't make a diagnosis that you're not trying to make. You can't find something you're not looking for. Okay, and like I said, that guy, six months of extra time where his cancer was growing because no one did the simple act of taking 30 seconds to examine his rectum. Again, it's not fun, it is sensitive for you and for the patient, but it has to be done, okay? Um, don't leave these things to chance. Okay, this is where problems happen. Okay? You need to know. You need to know everything you can know about the patient, so you just do what has to be done. And I got, I've already hit this point exhaustively. You guys are tired of hearing it. Uh, but these examinations do test you, and you're willing to serve the patient without thinking of yourself. And we want to encourage you in that. Again, it's not easy, and you don't get a lot of encouragement in that way going through medical school. And doctors are really held up here in society, especially here, right? And that's, that's good. It helps us build rapport with patients and get their respect. But in the end, the most important thing is not that we be considered up here by people, but that we're willing to come down here and serve them, okay? That's what engenders true respect for you as a doctor and you as a human being. So that's all I have to say about all those things. That's enough, right? It's been a long afternoon for you guys. Thank you for coming. Any questions? Push your wallet. Okay, so great. So if you have questions always, you can ask us later.